simple story of a simple people, but with a lesson for all mankind. High up on Mount Tichouk, in the heart of what is now Morocco, live the Seguchins, one of the poorest, most primitive of the Barbary tribes. Following the Berber custom, the women's faces are uncovered, but tattooed. From childhood, Seguchin men wear a top knot of hair. Berber legend has it that by this handle, the angel of death will lift them to paradise. They keep it ready, coiled and protected, under their turban. For the rest, their djellaba, their dress, is basically the same as the rough serge robe and the leather sandals that European peasants wore throughout the Middle Ages. Primarily shepherds, the Seguchins are good swordsmen and excellent riders. And when necessary, fierce warriors. For centuries, they had looked with envy from their barren mountain heights across the plain below, the fertile valley of Skura. Here at Skura lived the tribe of Sidi Said, a community of farmers. In the communal olive grove, no family owned more than one or two trees, and the land itself was often owned by someone else. Conflicts between land and tree owners were common, and discussions animated. In these mud-walled houses, the roofs terraced but without chimneys, the families of the Sidi Said lived the primitive domestic life of poor peasants the world over. where there is little grain to grind and many mouths to feed. Here, however, is an outpost of our own civilization. This fortress village, and hundreds of others like it, has stood for centuries against the Arab of the plains, against the powerful Arab chieftains, against the mountain people. Through the centuries, the bitter winter weather would force the Seguchin down from Mount Tichuk into the pasture lands below. And sometimes the migration would transform itself into a raid. At Skura, the alarm is sounded. children rush into the houses. In 1929, France intervened to bring order. A post was established commanding the valley, and an officer of native affairs assigned to maintain the peace. By treaty, lands were assigned each tribe. Now the Seguchin themselves have become part of that defense. The instruments of modern warfare worn over the traditional striped jellaba. While others moved to the cities to become part of the life that was transforming their ancient tribal ways. no longer wore their top knots in anticipation of a visit from the Angel of Allah. For Auntie Chuked, where the treaty had placed them, this nomadic people were unable to grow the grain they needed. With the new peace, the number of mouths to feed was ever increasing, while the amount of kesra, the flat, round native bread, grew less and less. Throughout Morocco, grain is a vital problem. 
Even in the fertile plains, it has become necessary to trade the old wood plow for the modern tractor. To extend this knowledge to the natives, numerous schools were opened, actually model farms, where peasants come to learn new methods of farming and gradually to handle the new machine. And so at Stora, one memorable day in March 1946, a delegation from Sidi Said journeyed to the fort in their valley. From the mountain galloped the representatives of the Seguchin tribe. A great Diema, or assembly, had been called to propose that the two tribes, traditional enemies, come together to improve collectively the uncultivated land in the plains. The technician who will direct the project makes a proposition. The new cleared land will belong half to the Sidi Said of the valley, theoretically the owners, and half will be ceded by the Magzin, the state, to the Seguchin tribes of the mountain who are now without sufficient land to grow their food. The representatives talk among themselves. It is a project that would revolutionize the customs of centuries. But then this meeting is itself a revolution, the first time the two peoples have ever met without the sounding of an alarm. It might work. They agree to try. It is one year later. Large tracts of land have already been cleared for the plow. By axe and by fire for the ordinary brush. These thorny bushes have mammoth roots that run deep and must be chopped out completely. Trees, fine old cedars, are felled by a single tug from the tractor. the clearing is not completed until every last stone has been carried away. This is the work of the women. Barefooted, taking tiny steps like worker ants, the Berber women are always carrying. Wood for the hearth, water for the cooking. Now it is stone from the field. Thus, the descendants of generations of nomadic tent dwellers have moved at last into the stone houses of civilization. Modest homes, it is true, but already little luxuries are appearing. The game board with different colored stones for the pieces. Coal, makeup for the little girls. These children learn the ways of civilization quickly. In the center of the valley, a souk has been built, a supermarket. The souk is a fair where each Friday the natives come to chat and to laugh together, to buy and to sell, to exchange both news and merchandise. Raw wool for the men's burnooses. And 
slabs of rock salt brought by caravan from the Sahara. There is also a school here. At noon, the young scholars have their lunch together in the open air. Many of them have to walk miles each day to get here. The teacher works closely with the area's technical director. Many of her pupils will soon become apprentices at the model farm. to be proud of these apprentices. Less than two years ago, the young men now working these machines were shepherds on Mount Tishu. And now, at last, the promised bread for Barbary. This machine can sow an acre in an hour, selected seed on virgin soil. repeats the solemn motions of sowing. Can machinery really perform the miracle of growth? The land is good, but now a new problem. Each year, the rain gauge shows less and less water. Water here is scarce and precious. The women carry it from miles afar in goatskin bags. And each spring, when the drought has been prolonged, a procession of children parade before their priest, carrying the bride of the rains, whose magic can make the storms descend from the clouds. been supplemented by a practical plan. An irrigation canal will bring them their precious water from a river in the next valley. These men and women are paid by the day, important. They know that they are really building for themselves, that this will be their canal to protect their crops, that they are blasting and drilling and digging against famine and want. Once the canal has been dug, mortar and stone are needed. be carried a thousand yards up the steep incline. Not by railroad, not by wagon, not even by mule pack. Again, it is the Berber woman, sure-footed as a mountain goat, strong and infinitely patient. All day long, the women mount and descend in an unbroken line just as, in ancient times, their sisters in Egypt once toiled. the head. 
head of the valley, a jubilant crowd assembles and prepares the traditional sacrifice. And now, for the first time, the life-giving water flows into their canal. Peasants and workers join together in triumphant procession. the tent of honor of the Kaid has been brought down from the mountain. Here, where famine is always on the horizon, any festival becomes inevitably and primarily a feast, the traditional Deepa. No speeches at a Berber banquet. The nourishment of God, says the proverb, is eaten in silence. Bacchanal is danced by everyone, all inspired by a common joy. Today, these men and women dance because fresh water has been brought into their plain. They dance because tomorrow, and on all future tomorrows, there will be bread in abundance for all. Today, they dance together, men of the Seguchin tribe and men of the tribe of Sidi Said, traditional enemies. Working together with their fellow men has brought them new prosperity, has brought them peace. 